George was certainly a master director. I found that he was very kind, very sensitive. I asked a lot of people who had worked with him, what's it like to work with him? And they all, to one, said, just make yourself a piece of putty and put yourself in his hands, and he'll do it all. And he was just wonderful. He loved actors. He was very exciting and excitable about actors. He was tough on crews, but he loved actors. I loved him. I followed him around like a puppy. I was a worship that man. George was kind and, and good to everybody, and I think he really treated us all as equals. He would go to great pains to go all the way around, over this way and that way, to make me think it's my idea, so that I would come up to him and say, George, I have a good idea for this scene. He'd say, what's that, Rob? And I'd tell him and say, yes, that's a good idea. And it was his all along. But it was really true that, that what everybody said, put, make yourself a piece of putty and put yourself in his hands and rely on him. And that was partly, I think, how a way of his to make the great films that he, and get the marvelous performances that he got out of people, because they just simply let it out. My old man brought in stock from Europe and bred him to the best we had. Look out, George, look over. Look out. Rock was very charming, he was very warm, very friendly. Uh, he was like a great big kid, too, at the time, kind of. You know, he was, oh, gosh, I think he was only about 30, yeah. He was positively good-looking. He was a big man, but he just had a gentleness about him. He was handsome and sensuous and marvelous as the young man, and then I thought he really excelled as the, as the elder man. I thought he did a wonderful job. He was inspired by the part, inspired by George Stevens. I thought he did a wonderful job. Rock Hudson was a wonderful, gave a wonderful portrayal of a, of a Texas patriarch, of a rancher who had certain bad qualities, but, uh, or areas where he could improve. But uh, on the whole, he was such a positive figure that everybody loved, loved him in the film and loved the, the portrayal of the Texan. There he is, son. He's all yours. Oh, my Well, Liz was a beautiful woman. You know, she's only 24 when we did this, and I guess the most beautiful woman besides my wife in the world. She had that wonderful facility of being able to make you feel like you were the one person she wanted to have at, your, at her party. You know, she was a great hostess and so warm and delightful. She works hard. She's strictly business. She knows her lines. She is superb. In previous Texas movies, Women characters are always in the background. Uh, they're there to stand by their man. Uh, and they really, I can't think of a significant woman character in a, in a Texas movie uh, before Giant. We're just talking business. Just business. Oh, well, please don't mind me. Do go on. I'll listen quiet as a little old mouse. You'd be bored, honey. This is dull. I'd be fascinated. Leslie, we're talking about politics. You married me in Washington, remember, darling? I live next door to politics. Brought up with them. Please do go on talking. I'd love it. This is men's stuff. Leslie, how about a cup of coffee or a drink or something? Men stuff. Lord of mercy. Set up my spinning wheel, girls. I'll join the harem section in a minute. Now, Lizzie, 
Don't you go worrying your pretty little head about politics. <laughs> you mean my pretty empty head, don't you, Judge? Could I get the coffee for you, Leslie? You too, Uncle Brutus. You don't feel well, Leslie. I feel just great. My adrenaline glands are pumping beautifully. Boom! If I may say so before retiring, you gentlemen date back 100,000 years. You ought to be wearing leopard skins and carrying clubs. Politics? Business? What is so masculine about a conversation that a woman can't enter into? Leslie, you're tired. Perhaps I am. She had some wonderful scenes which she did very well, which she felt passionately about, which were some of the women's rights scenes and telling her husband off and, you know, women must be treated this way and that way and we're not, you know, to sit in the back of the room or to be separated after dinner while you smoke your cigars. Yeah, she had some wonderful scenes. Well, thanks for the tea party, Jeff. And don't be such a stranger. You stop by and pay us a visit. Well, I don't know about that. Old Beck still got his cattle on for me. Once on his new property, Jet wildcats an oil operation and begins drilling. Just before he reaches the end of his rope, he hits it big. This is the road they used when he struck oil, Jim Medin. And uh, he came in and they had to make about six takes one after the other and he was a little bit upset because he was sticking in molasses they all looked you know like all but it was actually molasses and he came running around there right here's where they had the big circular driveway where jimmy come across he cut across right over here and that truck and pull right across here and run right across all her flowers and everything <laughs> Welcome in, babe. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Why, that's wonderful, Jeff. <laughs> Everybody thought I had a duster? Y'all thought old Spindle Top Mo Burke and Burnett was all the oil was, didn't you? Well, I'm here to tell you it ain't, boy. It's here. And there ain't a dang thing you're gonna do about it. My well came in big, so big, big, and there's more down there, and there's bigger wells. I'm rich, baby. <laughs> I'm a rich, I'm a rich boy. Me, I'm gonna have more money than you ever thought you could have. You and all the rest, you stinking sons of Benedicts. Leslie, you go out in the house. Take the women with you. <laughs> Jack, we're real glad you struck him. Now you go on along home. Oh, my, you sure do look pretty, Miss Leslie. You always did look pretty. Just pretty now, good enough to eat. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait, wait. Boy, take it easy. Take it easy, boy. Hey, come on. Wait a minute. Tess you, Vic. Tess is no cook. Vic, you 
should have shot that fellow a long time ago. Now he's too rich to kill. When the stars weren't busy filming, they looked for whatever entertainment Marfa could provide. What they found wasn't exactly Hollywood cafe society. Wasn't much to do here in Marfa back in 1955. There wasn't a lot to do in Marfa. You could go down and walk across the railroad tracks or something, or kind of, you know what I mean, go to the restaurant and sit around and talk to all the local gentlemen and all the cowboys, all the ranchers and everything. We used to drive from uh, Marfa to Alpine to the little country club there, and uh, that was the only place we could really party and have, uh, have something to drink. Some of us used to go down a lot to Ohinaga and the, the border town there. And uh, learned to, I learned to drink tequila real good. When we'd get through in the evening, we'd all have dinner at the Paisana Hotel. And we ate right in that dining room right there. You know, sat right in here and played music and sung at night. Every night after dinner, Liz Taylor would come in, rock, James Dean would walk in, and they loved to hear me do the cattle call. I can't do it anymore, but I mean, they just loved to hear it. And it was an every evening affair that we sat down after dinner and do a few cowboy songs and uh, just visit. So forth. I had a lot of fun with Monty Hale because, and he played the guitar, and my dad played a fiddle. And Monty Hale and dad would get together over at my mother and dad's house, and they'd have a jam session, and Chill Wills would join in, and he'd take my mother's coffee table, it was, it was a wooden, I think cherry wood coffee table, and he'd turn it up on its side, and wet these two fingers, and just run down the side of that coffee table, and it sounded just exactly like a bass fiddle. Jimmy and I used to go out in a pickup truck in the middle of the night and uh, with, uh, with the headlights and mesmerize all the rabbits. And uh, we killed a lot of rabbits down there with 22s. <laughs> there was no film lab nearby, so every day, as soon as shooting was finished, the film was loaded onto a waiting airplane. It was flown to Hollywood, processed overnight, and flown back to Marfa the next morning. Mr. Stevens would then watch the dailies at the Palace Theater. They rented a theater up here, and people could go and watch the, what was shot during the day, and of course, a lot of it was never used. The movie did not show all of what I saw. And my God, it could have been 10 hours long. Everybody would gather, the whole town. You know, the people who had all worked as extras, and they'd all gather in to watch themselves on, on the, in the dailies and the rushes. And sometimes they'd go on for hours, because George shot forever. He shot everything, you know, from every conceivable angle. I remember the first night I got there, and we went to the rushes, I saw, it seemed like 14 hours of, of, of cattle, you know, of, of Elizabeth and, and Rock sitting out on horses looking at the cattle, you know. It went on and on and on. Giant, he shot 860,000 feet of film, uh, and spent a year in the editing room. And some people have said that George Stevens begins to make his film when he gets in the editing room. And while that's not in fact true, it has some uh, symbolic truth. Well, George was a perfectionist. He, he, he would shoot scene after scene after scene over and over and over. He was a genius when it came to that. That's where George had his fun, in the, in the editing room. He cut Giant for a year. He worked on it for a year. So he really considered having carefully shot film from many angles and sufficient takes a necessary tool to making the drama work, to shape the film, to shape its structure, to set its pace, to alter its pace, to actually do the storytelling. I mean, several people have said he shot so much film from so many angles because he didn't know what he wanted. I never thought that. I always thought that if he's going to be a sculptor, he'd better have enough clay with which to make the bust, you know? And then suddenly, after almost two and a half months of rubbing shoulders with people whom you normally see only on magazine covers at drugstores, Marfa said goodbye to the giant. Well, we were pretty, pretty sad about it. I mean, it... Um... You know, when you've been living in the fast lane and then you drop back down to a little country town, it makes a lot of difference. 
the motels were evacuated. Everything was loaded up, and it all went out of town. And guess what? Since it left, it's still as quiet as it was. Well, it's the only thing to save, Marple. We were in a drought then like we are now. And uh, they came in and they spent a lot of money. A lot of the people just closed up the ranches and went out there and worked as extras. And it, it was a, truly a lifesaver. It was a different, you know, because we don't have California people here every day. They were really sorry when we went over here at this, when this train, there's a lot of people come over there that night and was standing out there when we left and waved. I remember James Dean and they were all celebrating and all they were all excited because they were going back home and then of course the tragedy happened. This was on a Friday, the 30th of September, 1955. Jimmy finished the day before, the 29th. He was going to Salinas to do some racing. I was gonna ride up with him in the car with his dad. His dad couldn't go, Rock had to do some loops so I couldn't go. Do you know, uh, George Stephen didn't let him drive the car or race while he was making the filming. He had the restriction that he could not race his cars. So the minute the film was over, he finished about two, three weeks ahead of everybody else. And um, he d told us that he was taking his fast car and he was going cross country. Left the studio about one o'clock. We went out and saw the car. He had a little bastard painted on the back, had the numbers on her and everything, and he's leaving. I told him, bye, I said, I'll see you in the morning. Unfortunately, James Dean died uh, before we finished shooting. Uh, the last two weeks of the picture in Los Angeles, he had a fatal car accident. Some kid in a station wagon turned right in front of him, had a head-on collision, said it killed him. Well, they was over running rushes over there in one of the projection rooms by the sound stage. And I leaned down, I said, George, I said, we've got a problem, I need to talk to you. He said, what's the problem, Bob? And I said, Jimmy's dead. <laughs> but Liz started hollering and crying. And <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. George and everybody was crying and carrying on, and uh, damn, I, this has been 40 years ago. I thought I was over that. And George left. And uh, I followed him. And we walked down through the sound stages, through Warner Brothers Live. And I lost him. I couldn't find him. I don't know where he went. I called my answering service uh, to, to find out if I had any messages. And there was all kinds of stuff going on the, at the board, uh, and, and they had Fran on the line. But that's when I found out Jimmy had been killed. Uh, he was, uh, it had just happened. It was a shock to all of us, you know, and uh, he was so young and talented. It was such a waste. I don't think there's any question in anybody's mind that in Giant, uh, a 24-year-old gives one of the greatest performances I've ever seen. Uh, he goes from uh, being a 19-year-old in the movie to being in his 60s and uh, uh, plays Jet Rink, and it's one of the most memorable performances ever on the screen. Giant would be his final performance. It was only his third motion picture. He was just 24 years old. Texans may have hated Giant the book, but they loved Giant the movie. When it was released, it was embraced as their movie. It's amazing how the film overcame all the handicaps that it had going in with the very hostile reception that Edna Ferber's book had gotten. I don't think of Giant as a Western, really. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's bigger than that. I mean, it's a, it's a, big, a bigger-than-life kind of epic. An epic is what I'm reaching for. The film shows us as, uh, as we sort of see ourselves, or at least saw ourselves in those days, as rather flamboyant, powerful, expansive, larger-than-life figures. It's true that Texas was the largest state in the Union, that it had this uh, incredibly rich and interesting history, 
that it was a place of Im where immense wealth could be obtained through hard work and, and so on. And yet at the same time, it was a Texas that had some problems. And the main problem was with the, its treatment, its second class treatment of Mexican American citizens. Buenos dias. You're in the wrong place, amigo. Come on, let's get out of here. Vamos, andale. Your money's no good here. Come on, let's go. You too. Hold on a minute. Yes? What do you want? Now, look here, Sarge. I'd sure appreciate it if you were a little more polite to these people. Oh, you would, would you? I'm Vic Benedict. Your neighbor, you might say. Does that give you special privileges? My name Benedict's meant something to people around here for a considerable time. That there papoose down there. His name Benedict, too? It is. All right, forget I ask you. Now, you just go back over there and sit down, and we ain't going to have no trouble. But this bunch here is going to eat somewhere else. All right, come on, let's go. Thank you. Come on, you two. Sue me. You're out of line, mister. Diner. I remember watching that, uh, I guess I was about 12 or, or 11 when I saw it, and I remember it was the first time that I directly realized uh, the effects of racism, and I wasn't fully conscious of, of all of the, the underlying themes of the scene, but I knew one or two dead-on things. Number one, racism was wrong, and number two, that when Rock Hudson was fighting that di guy at the diner for the right for that lady to sit and eat, that was the right thing. And it made a deep impression on me, and it made me go through the rest of my life never having to question about the possibility of whether racism is, is good or evil. Uh, it's evil, it's a sickness, and I despise it. And I, I, re I just remember sitting there thinking, I was so caught up in the emotion. Of course, they're playing the music in the background, and you're, you're feeling all Texan, and you're hearing the yellow rose of Texas, and then you're watching him stand up for something that was right. And that made a deep impression on me as a child. <laughs> It's amazing to me that one single movie has become such a part of our, our national character. I'm, I, I, we never realized when they were making the movie, nor did I realize until I was about 35, the impact that that movie had on the rest of the country and what a, a freezing of an image and a place and time, the effect that it had on the American public. When they made movies that they were very proud of, you knew it, you could sense it. I could certainly sense it in my father. Uh, the only movie I can recall uh, that he talked about in the same tones with which he talked about Giant was The Old Man and the Sea with Spencer Tracy. That was what they called a prestige movie. It was a term that Hollywood people used during that period to, to refer to something that they didn't necessarily expect to make money, but they made because they were, they were, they were imparting some of the quality that to the people who were involved in the movie making said, this makes us great as a studio. And Giant was also one of those films. It was a prestige film, but it was also a blockbuster success. It was very rare that you would find the two in one film. You can't look at that movie and not think of it as, as 